There they are. They're on it. Got him. He's up, he's up, he's up, he's up, he's up. Well, it's summertime and it's a beautiful time of the year down here in Victoria. It's actually Christmas holidays to be exact and today we're at a place called Inverloch, a very, very popular holiday destination. People come down here because of the great estuary system that flows through this area. However, there's some awesome fishing that's offshore. We're going to go over the bar today and in any bar crossing anywhere in the country, it is law to wear a life jacket. This is my PFD jacket. While it keeps me warm, it also keeps me alive. It's got the gas canister in it, but if anything did happen, unfortunately, you pull the cord, the gas canister pops, the jacket in floats, and you're gonna stay alive. The other thing you need to do, there's a lot of sand channels and stuff through here. Very, very important to wear a good pair of polarized sunglasses like these so I can see the light in the dark areas. As much as I'm gonna use the sound that'll follow the depths, just watching where those sand banks are to wind your way out through these channels and then also crossing the bar. It's vital to have these. It makes life much, much easier. Anyway, we're heading offshore, chasing some big whiting and whatever else may turn up. So let's get to it. As with all whiting fishing, we're using a variety of baits today from the good old pippy to some peeled prawn. It's great bait and also this stuff all makes fantastic burley and the key in these areas is not to burley too hard because you'll just bring a whole lot of rubbish fish being wrasse. The rigs we're using are the good old black magic whiting snatcher, which is your pad and rig, sinker on the bottom, dropper above, and that's the one I fish straight up and down. Works best just like that and the other one is the Whiting Whacker, which the boys have modified over at Black Magic. It's now on a much longer leader. It used to be on quite a short little leader about that long. We got them to make them longer, and the idea of this is that you can fish it as a running rig and have a great big long leader, or do as I like to do, tie a small dropper loop in that, like that, and that is now what I'll attach the sinker to, just a little one ounce bomb sinker. And I can loop him straight onto there and I can easily change sinkers as I need to. The idea of this rig, once it's tied on, works very nicely because you can cast it out the back. Circle hook, little KL10 with the flashy material on it. A little red bead that runs down on top of it. And best of all, you can cast this out and slowly drag it through the sand hole and you've got a nice bit of leader with a bit of movement there. That's the rig I really love fishing for the whiting. I think this is a whiting. A fair bit of variety in these sand holes. From the dirty wrasse to pinkies to trevally, all sorts of things. I have also got a big spin stick rigged up with a popper on it, because in this part of the world, down around the prom, you never, never know if a school of kings might just rock up at the back of the boat. There we go, look at that. Little pinky well and truly legal size but not what I'm after so ow I'll let him go if he is willing to lay still for me here we go clean little ocean fish Just pop him back and that's how you know your burley's working those guys come straight in on it and 
hopefully not too many of them will come in because that's the one thing that might push the whiting back is the aggressive nature of those pinkies. But anyway, we'll keep trying. going here is very heavy weed with big sand holes in it and quite often the case is to just keep casting your baits around the sand hole and the whiting will usually just be in one part of it so by casting out just slowly dragging your bait across the bottom you'll quite often find the fish much faster. Here he is now and I really did not think that this was a whiting at the start because it did absolutely nothing till it was straight up and down under the boat. Look at that. That is why you fish the ocean for whiting. What a hooter. That's a beautiful whiting. I reckon he's only about 42 or 43 centimetres. That circle hooks right in the corner of the jaw. He was not going to come off. There's something about these ocean whiting. They're just big and fat and very healthy. They fight well and they taste great. Sometimes big whiting do funny sort of things. Nah, it might be a trevally actually. That's all right, I'll keep these trevally because they make the perfect gummy shark bait for a session sometime soon. Such a tough little fish. They're actually not bad eating if you look after them too and bleed them and do all that, but hopefully I'll be able to turn this guy into some nice gummy shark fillets. Look at that. Not a bad trevally. Great looking little animal. When you do catch a trevally, just watch these little scoots near the tail. They're very, very sharp. And also those little anal spines there. Safest way to grab them is pretty much just like that. Squashy sort of dorsal down a bit. Just there. You can swallow that hook right down. I'll just cut that off. Here we go. And in the bait tank for you, mate. There we go. Come back this way. Stay away from the burly pot. This is another trevally, I think. Look at that. Nice trevally. Beautiful. Look at that. Haven't caught a trevally like that in Victoria for a long time. One thing you've got to be careful with with your trevally, very, very soft mouth. You can see that hook's already torn a big hole there. And that hook, We'll just fall straight out. Bad news for you, mate. Gummy shark bait. Now what I'm gonna do with these couple of trevally I've got, not bleed them or do anything like that because I am gonna use them for gummy shark bait. I'll take them home, cry and they'll be in pristine condition and they'll hopefully produce a few gummies. Now because we haven't got a lot of tide here, 
clouds come over, it's still important to wear your Polaroid sunnies because I can just see the light and the dark patches. And what I'm doing here is I'm casting way out the back because these fish are pretty flighty. They don't want to come in under the boat on the burley. Sink it to the bottom. And rather than fishing multiple rods, where you'll just tend to miss a lot of fish, what I'm doing here is sinking this down, just feathering the line to the bottom. It's now down there. And just by holding that line or the rod slightly to the side, doing this, I can just very, very slowly drag the bait across the bottom, like just move it. That rod tip's just bouncing. With the braided line, it seems quite aggressive. That's just the sinker bouncing over the lumps and the bumps in the sand and the bits of weed. And by holding it just slightly to the side as well, when you do get a fish come along and bite, you'll know straight away, but it also enables you to drop the rod towards the fish, let him take that bait just for a split second. If I just keep winding it like this with the line pointed directly through to the rod tip, it's very hard to move with the fish. Just to the side, much, much easier. In these patches here we've got heavy heavy weed and big clean sand holes and it's really just a matter of casting around the sand hole till you find the fish and they're biting very very lightly and they're not actually doing a lot till they get near the boat which is sort of a bit annoying but anyway I'll take them any way I can and especially when they're that size beautiful you've got to love catching these guys especially the meal that comes out of them at the end. There they are, they're on it. Got him. He's up, he's up, he's up, he's up, he's up. Um, the whiting session has turned into something else. So I was looking over the side and all of a sudden I just saw these big yellow tails just come cruising across the back of the boat. And for this reason, I had the heavier outfit rigged with a jet popper on it because in this part of the world around here you just never ever know when the big kings are going to show up and while we're chasing whiting you've always got that thought in the back of your head it's all about being organized come on ease up i just got to hope to god that there's not a big bomby out here somewhere i just decided to pull the anchor up and luckily we just made a quick move and i only have one whiting rod in the water so it made it that little bit easier to to yeah. No, this is bad. This is bad. I'm just very slowly edging up on this guy. I'm really trying not to upset him because I'm only in six metres of water here. And if I upset him, because all he's going to do is try and punch a hole into the bottom. And that's the last thing I want to do. I've only got very, very light drag on this fish. Like I said, I'm really just trying to not upset him too much. I'm looking here and this, uh, he's up this bottom. While it's reefy, it's predominantly low lying reef. And I've just got to try and get him out because just over that way there's sand. And if I can lead him out into the sand, we're right. My heart is just cranking right now because as much as you've always got that thought in the back of your mind that, you know, it'd be nice to see a kingy you sort of never expect it. And that's what kingies do. They rock up when you least expect them. It's why it always pays to be ready. He's up, he's up. up. Oh, that felt bad, something pulled them. Whether it was one of the sets of trebles or whatever, I'm not too sure. Come on, mate, just let me edge you out into the open. I'll just kick it out of here for a sec. Just slowly 
And rather than tightening that drag, I'll just use a bit of hand pressure on the spool. And try and lead him back. These little jet poppers are just such a good lure. People come into my tackle store and say, I want to catch a kingy on a popper, and we've got heaps of poppers on the wall. But for my money, you just can't beat these little jet popper. They're JP05. Something about them, I think. Personally, I reckon it's because they've got a nice big cup on them. They bloop nice and easily. They make a lot of noise. But then when they pause, they're only a little lure. And I think the kings obviously hear them from a long way away because of the noise they put out. But then when it stops and they see it, they go, that's about the size of a pilchard. You're gone. I should have some colour on him soon. So he's making those runs to the bottom, but they're not a frantic sort of head kicking or head punching run where he's trying to do me. I'm over this lighter bottom now. And that's all I've got to hope for is that he doesn't find some big lump of reef. And this is just a, basically it's my Western Port sort of snapper gear. It's a nine to 15 kilo T-spec rod, which it sounds heavy, but it's not. It's light, it's softer tapered. They bend nice and easy. And they look a bit like a toy, but they've just got a lot of pulling power. Uh, okay, now I've got to get these rods out of the way because if he comes under the boat, I've got to be able to walk around with him and this is what it's all about not panicking you can really guide your fish just like that while he's still a few meters away I'll just pop this door out that is a monster that thing's got to be getting up that's double the size of this fish whatever this is that is double like that could be a 20 or at least an 18 kilo fish and that's what kingies do, they're just so inquisitive. They just have to follow their mates, they have to see what their mates are doing. And that's why poppers are just such a good lure for them because they just have to come and check them out. Look at that, Victorian king. Love it, love it, love it, love it. On light gear, on a surface lure. <laughs> Does it get any better? I don't think so. Fairly sloppy 38 kilometre run seizes at the car park. Now our starting game here today is we're going to tow some skip baits. You may say, how have we got skip baits when we're just starting fishing? A very good friend of mine, George Trinkler, fished yesterday. He kept a couple of slimy mackerel for us. And the bonus to this is that Quinny and I can put two skip baits and a teaser out. And while we've got those out, we're watching the sounder very closely because we've got to find the bait to find the fish. Once we've found the bait, we just stop. He'll drop the bait jig down. We'll hopefully load up on slimy mackerel. Then we'll have fresh dead baits but also a whole tank of live baits and then we can do skip baiting we can do live baiting we can do switch baiting it pays to be versatile keep mixing it up if you're not getting the fish on the live bait this fish in here go to a skip bait vice versa keep swapping and just see how it pans out
go. That's our skip baits. Rigged, ready to go. Circle hooks on the nose, stitched up so they don't fall apart. Later on in the show, I will show you how to rig one of these. It's very, very easy and obviously very effective. There we go. Very, very handy thing when you're skip baiting or live baiting. This is a little marker that we put on the line. It's Dacron, it's a Dacron loop. And if I spread it out, it won't slide. But if I bunch this braid up, I can slide it up and down the line. This is set at about 40, 45 meters. And the bonus to this little guy is that I don't have to be guessing where my bait's going out every time, especially with live baits, because you can't see them swimming under the surface. That there, straight into the pin release clip, slide that up. And again, it's just making life faster and easier. It allows you to set exactly the same spread every time. Then it's just a matter of setting this drag so there is just enough that it won't overrun. The thing I'm watching for is obviously the skip baits because it's a very visual thing and you'll see the marlin come up on it. With live baits quite often, we just sit there and we actually watch the clips because you'll see the clips start to shake and bounce before the marlin eats it. In that case, you'll pick up the rod, put the reel in total free spool, ratchet off, thumb on the spool, pointing it at the fish so that when he grabs that bait and it pops out of the clip, there is no resistance. Quinny's gonna show you one other great trick so that you can convert more bites to hookups in just one second. What we're doing here with, with these skip baits, we've got to run a bit of a drop back because you're going a bit quicker. You don't quite get to see, uh, you don't have quite as much time to react. So basically all we're doing here is running sort of about a 20 foot drop back. And with trailer boats, because you haven't got as much room as your big boats, we just run these little clips and it just keeps your line away from anything that can get caught on. And the whole reason we fish drop backs, it creates a big belly in the line gives us a bit more time when the fish takes the bait, it doesn't feel any resistance, and we can get to the rod and hopefully convert you into a few more fish. Bait. How far down? Shouldn't be far, 60, 80, 100. Yep. Quinny's just dropping the bait jig. What I've got to do is stay on the wheel, try and hold us over it. This wind's obviously going to push us off. You've still got the two skip baits out here, and you're going to get a lot of marlin doing this. As those skip baits sink down, Quinny's pulling live baits up. The marlin come up to see what's going on. The first thing they see is these two dead baits just hanging off the riggers, and it can be a great way to catch fish. That is exactly what we've been looking for, a big ball of what should be slimy mackerel. Quinny's all loaded up there with the scattering of bait here. I've just been holding that boat back into the wind just to keep us over it. I'll get this live bait tank cranking. Oh, there's a bit of colour, Quinny. Yeah, mate, just coming up now. What do we got? Oh, nice. Quarter full That's string. That's what we're after. You all right, mate? The bait of champions. That is a slimy mackerel. That is a jelly bean to a marlin. Tough fish, hanging deep. Oh yeah, how good's that? And that's why you go marlin fishing. Oh, 